Hey guys, welcome to Tactical. I know it's been a while. Just came back from a little cottage getaway with some friends, but I'm coming back at you with a brand new video. Today's video is going to be all about NVIDIA Compunomics, and we're going to take a close look at the last six generations of NVIDIA graphics cards and try to determine exactly why a person like me is able to determine how they're going to perform before they even come out. <laughs> So let me start by saying, before I cut to the numbers, that you should always wait for benchmarks. Absolutely. I do not believe that you should pre-order or make a purchase before reviewers have had ample time to play with the card or product and tell you whether or not it's worth your money. So that's the first thing I want to get out of the way. But that said, I think the majority of why you should adhere to what reviewers have to say has more to do with major mechanical flaws in a product. You want to make sure that the fan is good, that it's drawing the appropriate amount of power, that the VRM design is good. Things like that are always good to check out. And of course, you want to validate what you probably already know about performance. But I would say anywhere from 70 to 90% of the battle is already won before the products even hit the shelves. And I'm about to show you why. So let's cut to the boring ass spreadsheet and I'll show you more. All right, so before I begin, I should go over the basics of silicon fabrication, which is pivotally important to the argument that I am about to make. Here is a silicon wafer. Yes, these blue things. I don't want to pull out MS Paint and draw you a picture, so deal with this. Now, silicon wafers are actually round, but for all intents and purposes, let's just say that they're fucking square, okay? And each one of the little cells here is a sliced, cut, chiseled GPU that is carved out of that wafer, all right? You follow me? Now, the first way that NVIDIA makes different classes, different performance classes of GPUs out of these wafers is by shrinking or expanding the GPU size. They can get more out of a wafer by going smaller and put more chips on a single wafer, or they can extract less and charge more per unit by going bigger. More performance for bigger, less performance for small. That's easy to understand. The second means by which they divide these things into performance classes is through a process called binning. Now sometimes chip over here functions perfectly fine, but chip over here does not. This one, this little guy here, has absolutely no problems, but this one, it turns out, well, they gotta chop off an entire SM block and uh, render it at about 75% effectiveness in order for it to be stable. That's binning. Now there are other factors involved as well in terms of how high they can clock them and so on. For this particular exercise, all we really care about is what is called the cut. How big of a cut into a particular GPU is a retail product going to be and how can we expect it to perform as a result? Generation one of the Fermi architecture on 40 nanometers came out around 2010, I think, I can't remember. Three chips, GF100, GF104 and GF106 came out of this generation. Die sizes of 529 millimeters square, 332 and 238, and various cuts. Relative performance is measured with the GTX 480 at the top and everything else compared against it. Here is the dollars that you would have to spend per point of performance you got, meaning the cheaper cards were, generally speaking, the better value, but if you wanted premium performance, you would have to pay the early adopter enthusiast tax and get the big motherfucker. And as you can see, the price descended accordingly. So a couple interesting things to note about Fermi 1.0. It was the first foray into the 40 nanometer process that Nvidia had made. AMD, or ATI, I should say, had already been there at the time, and yields on the process were particularly poor. And this is reflected in how deep the cuts of the lower end chips at the top had to be. The GTX 465 was only able to exist by cutting 31% of it off, essentially, laser etching those cores out, which gave it a relative performance of 70 versus the 480. The chip below it, GF104, did not fare too much better. They did not get a 100% cut out of GF104. They had to settle for a 94 with one SM chunk disabled, I think. And that gave it a 64 versus 100 and a 58 versus 100 for the GF104 chips. They did just fine filling the mainstream, but clearly something was missing. And then came Fermi 2.0 where they fixed it all. The 40 nanometer process had matured. They went back to the drawing board. They re-engineered the chips. This is truly a refresh. It was, certainly wasn't a total redesign, which is why it carried the same name, but it deserved to be in a separate sheet because it was distinctly different. 
GF110 and GF114 were triumphant successes, as you can see here by the relative performance. So the GTX 560 Ti 448 core, which was designed to replace the GTX 465, ended up performing 85% as well as the 580 versus the 70% of the previous version. And the 77% and 71% of the 560 Ti and 560 trumped the 64 and 58 relative performance metrics versus the 480 of the previous generation. So they made improvement at every price performance bracket by refining the engineering and by relying on better yields. Up next, we had the Kepler generation, which saw the introduction of the 28 nanometer process. AMD was first to market with the 7970, which was a mid-sized chip, and they were countered by the 680, which was also a mid-sized chip. This generation was interesting because it marked the first generation where both companies were focused on releasing their mainstream chip before the big fatty came out. The GTX 780, 780 Ti, Titan, Titan Black on the Nvidia side, and of course Hawaii on GCN 1.1 on the AMD side. This is important because it resulted in the ultimate slow roll to consumers. It gave them an opportunity to pass off the 680 as a flagship. It gave them an opportunity to pass off the 780 as a flagship when it was just a mere cut of its big buddy version, the Titan, which itself was a cut of the 780 Ti and Titan Black, which were fully enabled versions of the same chip. Moving on to Maxwell, GM204 came to market and they were highly successful, came on mid-sized dies, once again masquerading as a pseudo flagship before the 980 Ti and Titan X came out to crush them. Yields were considerably better thanks to the 28 nanometer process having matured and of course GM107 was included here because it was kind of an oddity, it was it was it came out before all these guys and it was included in the 700 series, it was kind of just like a proof of concept that a die as small as 148 millimeters squared could be effective and it ended up being true. Which goes to show you exactly how far graphics processing technology has come. The fact that we can make dies that are this tiny and still have them be competitive in the gaming market says something about where we're going. And here we are in the modern day with Pascal. The 1080 once again masquerading as the flagship GPU before the Titan XP came out to crush it just recently. But of course, the GP100 chip, Tesla P100, sitting out there in the wild in non-consumer applications being used. Who knows? Maybe there'll be a Titan Titan or a Titan X2 or something that trumps this motherfucker. I don't know. The bottom line is Nvidia is finding more and more ways to squeeze better performance out of smaller chips, leaving their bigger shit for later to capitalize on and get more out of the enthusiast market. But that's not what we're really here to discuss. Largely speaking, if you take die size percentages and look at historical cut estimates of various die sizes and what things have been priced MSRP wise throughout the years to fill a given market segment and how they perform relative to their masters in a given class, all of these question marks here become relatively easy to fill in. And that's exactly what we're gonna do now. I just noticed that I got the die size wrong here for the GP106 chip, so I've changed it. And the first card we're going to examine is the GTX 1050. Now, this is a mark my words kind of segment. I'm going to tell you exactly how I think it's going to turn out, and I'm going to take you through my logic. And then in a few months, when it finally does come to market, we're going to take a look back at this video and see how right I was. So if I had to make a prediction, here's how it would look. The 1050 or whatever it ends up being called, you never know, they're kind of running out of numbers as they go down the chain here, so it might be called the 1055 or 1050 Ti, is going to be a 75% cut of the 1060 and is going to perform roughly 75% as well, coming in at $179 MSRP. Now where does this number come from? Well, look at the Maxwell version. So Maxwell, the 950, was 159 and the card above it was 199 and they upped the price a little bit for that one, so I upped it a proportionate amount for this one. Versus the RX 470, which is roughly the card it's going to be competing against, which is currently priced at 149 this kind of price makes perfect sense. It may be 169 but I'd bank on 179 NVIDIA seems to be more marketable right now, and they're going to try to milk every dollar they can out of their consumers so expect to see prices like that. This would give it a $5.42 dollars per performance value which is perfectly fine and falls right in line with the gradient here and everything seems to match up nice and good. As for the 1060 Ti, let's make a few predictions. If it does come to market, and it might not because it's kind of difficult to position this card, it will 
be a 66% or so cut of the same chip, which is a rough estimate, because what they're going to have to do is kind of disable half of one of the GPCs on it instead of a whole one. I don't really know how they're going to do that. They certainly can't cut it down to an even half, because that would perform worse than 1060. So it's got to be somewhere around there. And as a result, it's going to be roughly a 53 or something like that. My math might be slightly off in terms of how it performs in relation to the Titan XP. It's MSRP, well it's obvious it's going to be in between these two numbers, but if we take a look at back at third cuts of other 04 chips in the past, we did not have one for Maxwell, we had plenty for Kepler, and the third cut of Kepler in the 600 series, which actually was the same chip, but just with a weaker back end as the GTX 670, ended up selling for 299 compared to 399 on the 670. So if we step forward to the future here, we have a 379 MSRP for the 1070. If this were going to be like the 660 Ti, this would be priced at 299 adjusted for inflation. Let's call it a 329, and that would give us a performance per dollar value of 621, which would actually be a little bit higher than the 1070, but that's not surprising. It's not always a perfect gradient as you go down the list. But I think that tells enough of the black and white spreadsheet story for today. Let's go back to Just Jeff for some moral of the story and some what we learned today. So whether or not I've made a believer out of you entirely depends on whether or not I'm proven right when the 1050 and 1060 Ti come to market, if they ever come to market. But I've already got a few points in my favor from the last video like this. Anyway, the bottom line is this. Here is the lesson that I want you to learn. The product name, whatever they decide to call it, especially NVIDIA, and they're pretty crafty with their naming scheme, has nothing to do with how a product performs. Just remember that. You can take various elements, including the die size, the transistor count, the CUDA core count, and of course the architectural improvements in IPC and clock speed, and you can take all of these things and mishmash them together and couple them with historical precedent and prices and all of these things and come up with what ends up being a very realistic, very applicable to within 3-5% to margin of error kind of estimation of how a product is going to be when it was released. I know it's a lot of words, a lot of numbers, but I hope this information made it a little bit easier for you to wrap your head around. What I will say yet again is this is not a substitute for benchmarks, especially when it comes to specific games on specific APIs. So it's a whole nother fucking slew of stuff involved when it's talking about the difference between DirectX 12 and DirectX 11 and Vulkan and OpenGL and all that shit. And the games, of course, vary greatly depending on whether or not they're more CPU intensive or whether or not it's just pretty pictures. All of that is stuff that this video is not meant to address. What this is meant to address is the raw performance value of a given graphics card and whether or not you can kind of bank on something being better just around the corner. So anyway, my next video is probably going to be a shitbox review. I'm just going to sit down on my couch, play three or four games that I really like that run really well on my $96 computer, and try my hardest to get more and more of you, young people and old people alike, into the arms of the master race. Feel the power, and I'll see you in the next video.